welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is the much anticipated return of the incredible series, The Scariest Thing in the Woods. Of course, as ever, please do let us know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and help build this community and help us smash through the target of the two years and 10k subscriber mark. That would be fantastic. As ever, I do appreciate all your kind comments, emails and DMs. Absolutely fantastic reading through those. Without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled The Scariest Thing in the Woods The Past the present, the future. Let's get straight into that. Come on, boy, I say to Lou. We have to move. It's hard to tell if it's caught sight of me or not, but it's still moving this way. Lou and I hit the tree line. I know it will not follow me in there, but is the damage already done? God, I hate drones. It's scary how we embrace and love tech. Little do we know, we are not getting a new toy, but a new way to give up our freedom. I'll make it back to my little cabin. I don't see the drone anymore. But has the damage been done already? And do they know that I'm here now? If I was to surrender, I would just then disappear like a 411 out here. There is only one way to ensure I am not found here. Drastic means for drastic actions. I sit in my chair, in my cabin. I decide that if I want to be unobserved, it's time to become one with the forest. I'm not worried. This is easy. I'm not going to lose my control. I'm not going to lose myself. I have been wearing a ranger uniform, but I now have other clothes. A jacket, jeans, boots and a shirt, so the uniform is burned in the fireplace. I sit before the fireplace naked and start to meditate. Transformation happens two different ways. You can meditate your way through, retaining most of what and who you are. The other way is emotional, which, like all the old movies, is as painful as hell. When we give in to our primal urges, they tend to control us, but only if we bow to it. After about 15 minutes, I can feel the changes start. In about 15 minutes more, it's done. The pain is marginal, lower back mostly. Luke gives me an approving look. As we go out and roll and play with the snow, just two large wolves having fun. I'd forgot how much fun this was. I cannot speak and my mouth doesn't form human words, but my mind and my memories are all mine. Lou and I lope across the area. We're down on cave falls now. There is something in the air, literally in the air. My ears pick it up before my eyes. A helicopter is heading to the area. I guess that drone spotted me. I really don't want them to find the cabin, but it may be too late for that. Lou and I wait in the tree line, just wolves watching the intruders. They search the area, but they don't find the cabin. Well, at least not yet. I decide to make a very non-wolf bold move. I step out of the tree line and howl. And they turn toward me. I dart off. I can hear them debating if that was a wolf or Johnson's pet. One says, if there are wolves out here that size, I think we need to regroup. About 30 minutes later, they convince themselves and load in the chopper and leave. Lou and I are out here again, just two wolves alone in the forest. Nothing wrong about that, right? Two young men sit at their desks, talking, taking a small break from class. The teacher is writing out the next lesson when a tall, stately man enters the classroom. The teacher immediately bows, saying, My lord, you grace us with your presence. The man waves away the fawning compliment. Boys, with your teacher's permission, I think you deserve a break from this study. I think tonight, we should hunt. Both boys literally leap with excitement. Meet me in the courtyard at dusk. I want you to wear your oldest hunting clothes. Both boys run off to comply. The Lord of the Province addresses the teacher. How do their studies go? The teacher replies, Your nephew is much slower than your son. I fear the level of the education he is receiving mostly escapes him. Your son though, my lord, could be a scholar if he chooses to further his education. He will be a great and wise lord one day. And are you helping my nephew as much as my son? The lord says sternly. 
Or are you persuading me, helping a future lord, and leaving my nephew on his own chances? Master Teacher, would you like to join us in a hunt tonight? Uh, my lord, I assure you I teach both boys equally. Your son is very quick of wit, a very intelligent young man. He could easily attend any school in Paris, even be tutored by the king himself. Your nephew, he isn't that bright. He can reach the level of a local gentry if he applies himself more. A soldier, perhaps. Maybe the church, but his temperament is somewhat lacking. About hunting, my lord. The man is visibly sweating and shaking. I do not hunt, my lord, and would surely slow you down and the boys. Very well, master teacher. Leave me, I will consider your words. I must prepare the boys for hunting. The lord leaves behind a visibly shaken teacher. The lord smiles at his intimidation of the man thinking about a hunt when his usefulness is used up. The younger of the two boy asks his father, I do not understand, mon papa. This is different than normal hunt. Why simply not become wolves in a house like we normally do before taking a field? We hunt differently tonight, my boys. Different prey, different tactics. They stalk to the place along the road. Tonight, this is where we hunt, my children. Listen carefully. Tonight, you do not become wolves, but you will change to the loop garou. The man is an enemy of the state. And that will come down this road. You will take his life. Both boys nod their heads, but only the younger one looks unsure of himself. Allow the rage to overcome you and think of a powerful wolf and man at the same time. The older boy yelps as the change starts to occur. The younger is mesmerized watching his cousin transform. His father slaps him. Get angry, my son! And then the change starts to come over the younger one. The older child's size doubles, joints expand and teeth elongate. The younger boy is screaming on the ground as the older finishes his transformation. The older boy laughs at the younger until he starts to grow even. His father is surprised at his size and power. His transformation is now complete and he stands fully eight feet tall, a full foot over his older cousin. The Lord says good. These are your true hunting forms. A carriage is heard coming, highlighted in the full moon. And the Lord says to his children, kill them. They attack the carriage. The younger and larger creature slays both horses in a single swipe of the claw. The older but smaller werewolf grabs for the driver, who produces a gun and fires into the creature before he too dies. The younger looks at his cousin, but the wound is already healing as he rips the door off the carriage the family inside. A man, woman and child scream at the two large monsters, begging God and anyone else to spare their lives. A voice tells them to hold as the lord of the area walks out. The price for sedition in Jevordan is death. Mon loop, kill him. The younger and the larger werewolf grabs him by the throat and rips it out. Now the other, the old man roars. The younger werewolf looks to his father and says, What? The woman and child are innocent. Kill them! The old man roars as he starts to change. The older, smaller rips into the wife and the child ending their lives instantly. Later that night, back in human guise, the Lord chastises his young son. Why did you disobey me? The man father was guilty of treason that is punishable by death. His crime doesn't fall on his family though. I do not wish to kill just to satisfy some need for pleasure. It, it, it isn't right. His father respects his courage for standing up to him, but his lessons are far from over. I had forgotten how much fun this is to completely lose yourself. Lou and I are running around like crazy, and not concerned about being seen any longer. The right person might recognize Lou, but I doubt it. We can roam around Yellowstone as long as we don't become problem animals. They will not send hunters after us. That would make me laugh, if I could, in this form. All seriousness. I decide to do some scouting, as long as we stay undercover. We should be fine. 
We head to the office area and we stay undercover. But the admin area is a buzz with activity and there is a chopper there and the FBI team is here along with a couple of marshals. Good lord, they want me bad. I thought this hunt was going to be called off. Well, lesson learned, never trust a politician. I overhear one of the marshals talking to Ranger Jafaiz about chances of me returning here. Jafaiz is sure I will show back up here, and the marshal, not so sure. I would love to bite Jafaiz in the butt, but I'm not up on my shots. I have things to do, and I can't wait to be exonerated. The path to the south is yet to be travelled. I'm not sure, but I have to face down south. Lou and I head back to the cave falls. I revert back to my human form and start to gather my gear. Four handguns, one rifle, a few clothes. I have too many rounds and no way to transport them. I need to take the rifle. Which handgun? I decide on the 50 cal Smith & Wesson. The other three handguns are wrapped in oil rags and secure them in my little cabin. And as I gather my gear, I hear that helicopter coming back. Lou and I find a safe location and watch the hello land. And out steps Jafias and the FBI team. The six men fan out looking for any signs of me around. I don't have time to peacefully change back. Plus, I don't want to leave my gear unattended. My luck, they would come across my pack. Even a blind squirrel finds a nut on occasions. So, I will just have to stay out of their way. They search the area for about an hour. And the leader of the FBI team seems to be arguing with Jafias. They don't want to be out here after dark. <laughs> Smarter them. Reluctantly, they pile back into the chopper and take off. I return to my small cabin. I look at all the things inside for one last time. I don't know when the next time will be when I return, if ever. I hate leaving weapons and ammo behind, but there is no way to carry it. Before I walk out, I stare at the hanging on the wall. Even after my father disowned me, my mother wouldn't allow me to leave without it. Remember who and what you are, Mon Loop. I look at the marking. It's faded, more than a little, but I still see it for what it is. The crest of the House de Hue, the last Marquise of Gévaudan. A young couple share an embrace in the deep gardens of the manor. The two have been bereft for 13 years, ever since the girl was born. The boy, a couple of years older, has never even thought not marrying this strikingly beautiful young woman, even only at 13. All he has heard others speak of is how beautiful she is. The girl pouts. I don't want you to go. If you could stay here, we could be married in a couple of months. The young man says, I do not wish to leave you either, but my father has entreated this king that I would spend two years in his service before my knighthood, and I must be a knight to assume my father's mantle. The girl rises. You want to go, as your father says, ever the paladin for the king and country. No, I do not wish to serve this king. Even my father says he's but a shadow of his father. I will lead all of France to destruction. I must, though, do my duty to my family. What about doing duty in me? She says, I am mad for doing this. I do this to cement my place here, to make sure you are the lady of this. I love you, Michelle. A smile returns to the young girl's face, and she beckons the boy, about to be a man, back into her arms. Time has no meaning for them, until a sound interrupts the silence of the night. They both rise to defeat as the sound becomes more pronounced. The young man retrieves his weapon, a fine rapier, and with the young girl behind him, looks into the bushes. A moment later, he sees another young couple settling down by a tree. He smiles, just to our age seeking to enjoy themselves. How dare they? The young woman protests. Kill them immediately! The young man pulls the girl back a few steps, telling her to shh, and she whispers back, You should kill them! Are you not to be the lord of this land? And they have no right to be here! They are doing no harm. And if the lord went around killing peasants, soon he would have no one left to lord over. Let's go, leave them alone. Henri would kill him for me. The young man looks at her disapprovingly. The girl's anger is hot, but she knows her tactics will not work on the young lord. If you kill them, I will give you a gift. 
I have heard how large you are, how your power, even at your age, is second to none. Do this little thing for me. Show me your power, and, in return, I will give you my flower. No, I will not harm these young people. I will not have the peasants of this province afraid to enjoy themselves. I am leaving you, and if you do not wish to come with me, then it is your loss. Oh no, mon amour, it is your loss, she hisses as she begins to disrobe. The young lord watches as the girl drops her clothes and her smooth skin starts to be replaced by hair. Her muscles flex and elongate, her eyes turn golden yellow as a row of row of gleaming white teeth become longer and sharper. Hands that were once only human a moment ago are soft and replaced by long, long fingers and talons. The transformation completes and he stares at her in horror. As the beautiful 13 year old girl is now 7 foot tall, half wolf, half human, creature, she growls low and dangerously at him and then takes off through the woods on her mission of death. The two peasants stand horrified as the werewolf moves in for the kill. Then, as the young lord bursts through the trees, get back from her, he says menacingly, brandishing his sword. I will not allow you to harm these people. The werewolf has a perplexed look on her face. If she attacks the young lord, she runs the chance of injuring or even killing the man she intends to marry. But will he kill her if she attacks? A howl breaks the woods and she knows what it is. And she lowers herself and slips off back into the deeper, darker parts of the woods. The young lord explains to his father and Lord Darnie, the girl's father, his actions. Lord Darnie asked, would you have killed her? Oh no, my lord, I would never have harmed her. I only sought to protect the innocent. He accepts excuse, but is still not happy and leaves. The young man talks to his father. I will not kill wantonly, father. I am not aggravated at you, my boy. Go to bed tomorrow, you leave for Paris. A young squire runs into the barracks. James, James, uh, you have news from home, a paper. And the paper reads, April 1764. Two young people found murdered in Jevaldan. Suspected animal attack. Wolf. I'm tired. Part of me just wants to stay away from man and be wolf. But I know that I can't do that. My father always called me the little paladin. Holy warrior. Do what's right. My father said I came by my honour. By legacy. But, also said in this world, it was useless. He didn't mind my sense of honour, and he didn't lose his temper until I refused to marry Michelle. Well, enough reminiscing. I have to contact Tom. I'll find a place in this forest where there is cell phone signal and turn it on. I have five missed calls, and the message is, it says there's been a change, and Tom needs to speak to me. I call Tom, and Tom answers. Tells me it's time to come in, my name has been cleared. I move back towards Park HQ. I scope out the area before I approach. No FBI or US Marshals hanging about. I call Tom again and ask him, where we meet Anna? He will be at this meeting. Tom tells me he and her will be there, along with a representative from the Department of Interior. Jeff Ryers and one US Marshal and you. He gives me the time and place, which is funny. I'm actually already here, I tell him. I will be 15 minutes. I send Lou off back into the woods. If this is a trap, I don't want him to be caught. I leave my rifle in the tree line and walk to the office. I don't knock, I just open a door to see the men and Tom that told me it would be present. I take a seat and the questions begin. I'm not completely off the hook. I'm told I'm still a person of interest, but enough people have stood up for me to allow my freedom while more investigations continue. I ask, what if I'm free to move around the country? I am told, within reason, as long as Dr. Thompson and Tom are with me. I accept the conditions, but tell everyone that I'll be heading to Baton Rouge. I have to speak to my father. King Louis XVI calls for the youngest soldier. I am sending you home, my boy. There are problems at home and you need to speak to your father. There are scary things hiding in your forests, and I believe in your future.
the scariest thing in the woods road trip let's get straight into that it feels good to be with friends again I'm not saying Lou isn't my best friend it's just nice to be around people that have your best interest at heart Tom, Bill and Steve are with me and Lou and we're sitting and enjoying a few drinks they ask me what happened to Tony I relate that Tony is leading his own pack now up in Canada we decide to drink a toast to Tony and his new life to Tony I say as we raise our glasses who's Tony a large man asks it's that marshal I saw in a meeting this is US Marshal Trent Lewis Tom introduces us he's a good sized man I would guess about 6'4 and at least 250 pounds he looks like he could play linebacker for a pro football team if he wanted to. I say a good friend that went on to live his life and is happy. May I sit with you gentlemen? He asks. Of course, if Mr Johnson doesn't mind. I tell him no, no objections at all. Call me Jim. Even Lou goes over and welcomes him. I warn him that sitting with us he might hear some things that he might consider, well, strange. He chuckles. Well, as long as you're not going to confess to those murders, I think I can handle it. I want to gauge his reactions. I can't tell you anything about those men that died in Lufkin, though I have an idea. That poor ranger over in Kentucky was killed by a dogman. And to his credit, he doesn't seem too surprised. He shakes his head. And I ask him, you don't seem too surprised or even sceptical. He smiles. Go on. I relate that I was tracking a pack in the LBL and came across the Alpha carrying the dead body of the Ranger. Mr. Johnson, I'm from Louisiana and long have I heard stories of the Rougarou and the like my entire life. This may be why I was given this assignment. What assignment? I ask. To keep you in my sights. Remember, you're still a person of interest in these murders and since the powers that be do not believe in a supernatural, I am to follow you on this mission that you speak about. I am not saying that I don't believe you in this matter. I am saying that if you prove to me you might be guilty, I will have to bring you in. I nod my head saying, fair enough, but you might reconsider coming with me everywhere. I have been known to end up in some strange situations in the deep forest and I am used to working alone, except for Lou here and Tony before he went his way. Well, I am sure if this Tony fellow can handle it, I can. There is a round of laughter at the table. The marshal asks, what's so funny? Bill stops laughing long enough to say, young man, you're big but <laughs> you're not Tony. The man has a puzzled look upon his face. As Tom says, I don't think you're as strong as Tony either. And then Steve says, I know you aren't as fast as he was. The marshal stands to his full height. You make this man sound like he was a Rougarou himself. The entire table, even Trent, is laughing now. It's good to know this man has a sense of humour. Even Lou has his head cocked like he understands. I say, you will do fine, son. You will do fine. Guys, we have a road trip tomorrow. Well, we best get some sleep. I go to bed, but I don't sleep very well. I am troubled by many dreams. Mostly that I know I'm going to see my father. And I'm going to see the scariest thing in the woods. We are headed southeast towards Louisiana. This is a large vehicle and it holds the five of us and Lou quite comfortably. Tom is driving with a marshal sitting next to him. Steve, Bill and myself are in the next seat with Lou in the back stretched out. There is still room for our luggage. Bill seems deep in thought, texting on his phone. The marshal breaks the silence. Mr Johnson, why are we going to meet with your dad? Do you think he may be able to shed some light on this case? Give you a stronger alibi or point me toward the killer. No, Marshal. No, Marshal Lewis. I, I do not expect him to assist us at all on that endeavour. I doubt he cares about what happened to those men. He would not help you at all. He would dismiss you like you never existed. I can be quite persuasive, the Marshal says with an air of certainty. I am sure that is true, sir. But in this case, number one, I will be meeting with my father. Number two, 
He would not recognise your authority, and, if you were persistent, you might not enjoy the circumstances. I'm pretty sure I know who killed those men, but your chances of capturing them is even slimmer than your chance of capturing me. And, if by some chance you did corner them, it would most likely be that, well, that you will be caught. The marshal turns and looks me square in the eyes. You surrendered before I started hunting you. I promise you, Mr. Johnson, if I had, I would have caught you and make no mistake about it. If you'd made me, I would have finished the job. When I look at this man's non-flinching manner, a matter-of-fact stare, you have no idea what you are dealing with. Even those other men, my friends, have no real clue what's out there. If you think that piss-ass Glock 19 you carry is any kind of weapon against what we may face, then you are as dumb as that piece of metal on your belt. Would you two just shut up? I need to take this call. Bill shouts over the banter. As his phone now rings, he picks it up to say, Okay, Dwayne, talk to me. What have we got? Are you sure? Damn! Jim, I'm afraid Steve and I will not be able to go with you down to Louisiana. We have a major problem to attend to in Oklahoma. Tom, can you drop us off close to the Hodgetown State Park? Jim, we have a missing family, and maybe a good way. Louisiana would still be there. Let's handle this, and we need to save that family if they're not already dead. I'm going to need a weapon, though. I... Wait a minute here. I didn't sign on for this. We can't just veer off the mission. And I have a killer to catch. The Marshal protests. Well, this is happening with you or without you. You are welcome to meet with us at Baton Rouge. We will be there after we deal with this situation. You would most likely just be in the way and get yourself hurt or dead. I don't threaten easy, Mr. Johnson. I am not threatening you, Marshal Lewis. This is serious business. And even though I only know what Bill has had me read of this creature, and he can tell you more if he wishes, but I do know they can kill. And it doesn't matter how big and well-armed you are. If you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, you're plain and simple. Dead. Bill chimes in. Gentlemen, please, gentlemen. Jim, please imagine a cross between Tony and what you saw down in Texas. Very aggressive, and that's a good way. The marshal looks completely confused. And I shake my head. Like I said, I need a weapon. My account is no longer frozen. What I need is my Remington M24R 308 with an 18 time scope. The marshal looks at me. That's a professional sniper setup. Even if you could buy that, where would you? And then I don't know if I can trust you with such a weapon. You're a person of interest in an active murder investigation. Bill gets off the phone, says one will be waiting for you at our destination, and you owe me $3,500 plus shipping. Tom continues to drive. Steve and Bill are quietly discussing the future events. Lou is wagging his towel and yawning. The marshal is fuming. He's so mad. I hope he doesn't bust a vessel. And I am just sitting contently. Why am I content? Because I know who the scariest thing in the woods is. We enter Oklahoma and drive across the state to the southeast corner of Hodgetown State Park. The area is a buzz just like all the 411 sightings tend to be. Bill's researcher, Dwayne, is waiting for us, and he fills in Bill, and turns to me. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Johnson. I tell him to call me Jim, as he hands me a box that was delivered this morning. I look to Bill, he just shrugs, and says wonders of the internet. I unbox and start to set up the rifle, with that marshal looking over my shoulder. With the rifle, I clean and attach the scope, and start to bore the sight in it. I will have to have it laser sighted at a later date. Time is of the essence right now. I start loading the mags with the copper tipped rounds that Tom has secured for me. Shouldn't you be using silver bullets? I hear Trent say. I say matter of factly, we're not hunting werewolves. And just for your information, silver bullets in a weapon like this are useless. And he's been goading me the entire trip. It's time I put him in his place. Silver doesn't kill werewolves, Trent, but it's a hard metal. It will hurt them. But unfortunately, a hard metal like silver doesn't rifle down the barrel of a gun well. This rifle is a precision instrument. A few silver rounds and this weapon wouldn't be worth anything. I am using the copper because it's still soft enough to rifle through the weapon and keep its accuracy. And still be hard enough to injure these thick skinned creatures. From what I've been told about the Gugwe, they have been brought down with rifle fire, though it takes some hard hits. If we go after the werewolf as you call it, 
I will convert these rounds to hollow points, and add a few drops of liquid mercury, quicksilver, if you will. Again, it's not instant death for my quarry, but it hurts like hell. I look up at the marshal's face, which has gone completely ashen. You actually believe these things exist, he stammers. Trust me, Trent, they do exist. I was as skeptical as you a few months ago, till I was totally immersed into it. You remember us talking about Tony? He nods. Well, Tony wasn't a large man. He was a nine foot tall, 500 pound walking bipedal wolf. The marshal starts to stammer in the broken French dialect known as Cajun. I understand it all. He is visibly shaken. He repeats over and over again, the Rougarou, the Rougarou is real. The Rougarou is real. I tell everyone I'm going in alone. Well, me and Lou, who has been waiting patiently through this entire episode. Trent wants to tag along, and so does Bill. Even Tom has his rifle out, a 7mm mag. Guys, I say, I could travel faster with just Lou and myself. After a short discussion, I'm off, and Lou and I are off loping through the woods. I find the area where the camp has disappeared from. There are still two missing, a total of four bodies so far. Two members of the party were found dismembered. Lou picks up the trowel. I think to myself, are other dogs just as sharp as Lou? Or does his wolf nature give him an edge? Or is it his parentage? Not even a dog can say he was sired by a Wahila. It's twilight now, and as we move through the forest, I don't know the good way. All I have to go on is what Bill has told me, which should be gospel to me. But I have learned for myself, dogmen are not always aggressive. Quite possibly, they just want to be left alone. He says the Gugwe is different. They live for killing. All at once the smell hits me, and Lou also reacts to it. It's that coppery smell of blood, and a lot of it. 200 more feet in, and I see it impaled. Upside down on a tree is a body. It must be one of the missing campers. It's flayed open, like something feasted here. It may be too late, but at least I'm on the right trail. I mark this location on my GPS and continue. It's midnight now, and Lou and I have ranged in quite a bit. An unnerving chain of events is now unfolding, and I'm following two creatures deeper into the woods. I'm going to stumble onto an entire clan, or let's hope not. Two will be hard to bring down, but an entire clan might be impossible. I am almost certain that the last camper isn't alive, but I can't take that chance. I would change my tactics if I wasn't concerned about a life. But as long as there is hope, I hunt. A few more miles in, it's about 1am and I hear a noise. Lou and I become invisible in the foliage. These MVGs aren't as good as my old pair, but they'll do the job. As a large creature lumbers into the clearing, not as big as Tony, I think to myself. About 8 feet, shaggy, looks more like an ape than a dogman. But I'm still impressed. It's looking for me. My early warning system has his ears up, and so I'm not worried about being flanked by the second. The second one also comes into the clearing, and this one is dragging a body. I can only assume it's the last camper. I have had enough, and I stand, sight and fire in one fluid motion. One is hit solid in the chest, and has a surprised, almost comical look upon his face. The first one is also slow to react. I release another shot as Lou charges the other one. And to lose credit, he bowls the first one over and rolled in a snapping in a dogfight, and it's on. The second is still standing with a perplexed look upon its face, but a third shot takes it down and it doesn't rise again. Lou is more savage than I remember him ever being, as he rips into the creature. He disengages just long enough for me to sight my target and end the fight. I stayed here for a bit, and the forest is silent. I mark the area on the GPS and hike out. After I return to the base camp, I tell them what happened. They send in a crew to retrieve the remains and they find the two campers. But the two dead Gugwe are not to be found. Go figure. I relate the story to my friends and Trent is anxious to get back on the road. I suppose this can't be delayed any longer. I guess it's time to go out and meet the scariest thing in the woods. The bodies of the last two campers have been flown out. I find it hard to believe that the bodies of the Gugwe are gone. Were there more of them that took their bodies, or is this more government cover-up bullshit? Johnson, 
I don't see any monsters. I see only you and that wolf and more dead people. I say, yeah, a day earlier, and I might have saved them. The marshal believes I did it, and is not silent about it. Bill explains to him, but he's not having it. He wants to arrest me. I'm not listening to them. I completely zone out. He knows he will see his family on the morrow. He can hardly wait to hug his mother and greet his father, who will be proud of his accomplishments as a musketeer and the honor guard of the king himself. He will also see her, the most beautiful woman in the country, if not the world itself. He and his horse to run faster. He realizes his horse cannot keep up this pace for long. And unless he wants to show up at his father's house on foot, he better slow down. He pulls his horse to a low trot as his two retainers catch up. They joke about him wanting to fly home, but not so much to see his family. One young man who has been his friend since childhood says, Oh, James, you're an aristocrat, soon to be knighted by the king. You've earned a commission as a lieutenant in the Royal Musketeers. Your strength of arm and swordplay are unmatched. Your choice of any woman in Paris, and you pine for only her? I think you are bewitched, my friend, he says, laughing. Bewitched, I may be, and if I am, let the spell become stronger. They all laugh together, and they top the hill and notice a wagon stopped near a head fly noble standard. I know that standard, the young man announces. He rides up to see a nobleman sitting, directing his servants. Well met, Lord Antonine. May I be the first to welcome you to Jevaldun. Camp is made, and the two noblemen discuss the problems that have plagued the province for the last two years. I guess this is why I was sent home, but I find it quite hard to believe my father cannot handle this problem. Cannot or will not, says Lord Sanquois Antonin, the king's personal gun bearer and bodyguard. It's no secret, young Dehu, that the king's popularity is waning, and several of the provincial lords' support is waning too. You accuse my father of treason? The young lord stands, placing his hand on a pommel of his rapier. Sit, lieutenant. No one is accusing your noble father of treason. At the most, he is guilty of being lethargic. I will not sit here and allow you to defame my father, says the young lord, as he storms out of the camp. He walks into the forest, contemplating what he has heard. When a familiar scent he picks up, he turns to see a great wolf staring at him, and instead of running, he simply smiles, greeting Henri. The great wolf almost smiles himself, and he comes closer. Very suddenly a great crash comes from behind him and he pulls his sword. As he hears his name being called, he turns to face the great wolf again with the sword in hand. Run away, Henri! You cannot harm this man! Lord Antonine emerges from the brush to see the giant wolf square off with the young lord, with his weapon drawn. He fires and misses as the wolf disappears into the forest. Musketeer, what were you thinking? Brave but stupid to challenge a monster like that with only a sword. And you spoiled my shot. Or this would all be over. Just whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Out of my thoughts. I don't know whose side you are, Johnson. Are you a monster or a man? I am a man, Marshal. But there are many scary things in the woods. I am just one of them. We finally enter Louisiana and then Baton Rouge. It has been tense since that short hunt. And the Marshal believes that I killed two more people. My friends know that is not the case, but this man is bound and determined to arrest me. We check into a motel, one that allows very large dogs. I will need to send word to my father to see if he would allow me to meet with him, and to see if the others will be allowed to even enter the estate, much less the house. Prepare a formal letter to my father. I find a person to act as a courier and offer him $20 to deliver the letter to the Dehu estate and $200 when he returns with a reply. I decide to walk around the city. I have not seen it in years. Trent insists on accompanying me, so Tom walks with us. And of course, Lou stirs up a lot of commotion. Most people have never been with a wolf, much less on this size. Lou takes it all in a stride, though. I swear that dog thinks he's some kind of celebrity movie star or something. I walk around town is pretty uneventful. It's a lot bigger than I remember. But the one thing that happens is a strange lady, definitely Creole in appearance, looks us over very hard, even taking out some sort of charm. Trent laughs, saying that he's not the only one that thinks you're hiding something. And that woman is a voodoo lady, and she's wary of you. 
And I say we, oui, Jamis. I return to the motel and the courier that I sent to my father's house says he was not allowed to enter. But a beautiful dark haired lady took the letter and said that she would meet you at Port Royal tonight at nine. He asked if that was enough. I say yes it is and hand him two hundred dollars. I suggest we get a little rest, eat something. We are going to the docks tonight, to a bar. I would suggest also, you'd be on your toes there too. That night we enter the bar, no one says anything about Lou. The server brings a bottle to the table and says enjoy gentlemen. Everyone seems surprised, except me. Trent looks at the bottle and says cognac. In a dive like this, Bill chimes in. It says not just any cognac, but at the end court, this stuff is $1,400 a bottle. Well, I know it's my father's preferred brand. You might as well drink up, gentlemen, and enjoy, because this may be our last for a while. Lou and I both detect the smell before we hear the sweet voice. Bonsoir, gentlemen. We all turn to see the raven-haired beauty that is Michelle. Bonsoir, mon amour. I trust you are well, she says. And your little chien too. She pauses and she eyes Lou. I have never seen her at a loss for words. Your loop is somehow different, she says, as Lou stares his yellow eyes into her golden ones. Yes, he is Michelle. It's a long story. Michelle, are you here on behalf of my father? Oui, mon amour. Your father will meet you at any time you wish to come to the house. Will he also meet my friends? No, James, he will not. Only you he will meet. But if you like, I can entertain your friends while you meet with him. Especially this big, strong man here. She says seductively towards Trent. Michelle, I say harshly. As Lou also gains to his feet ready for action. If you harm any one of these men, I will hunt you down and avenge them. Trent jumps to his feet and yells, Johnson, if you threaten this woman again, I... You'll do nothing, Lewis. This woman can, and if she gets the chance, would kill you without pause. The marshal looks perplexed. Oh, James, you are such a paladin, but I believe you, she says. But I would only want to play with them, she mews. Like those men in Luftkin, I say. I was angry that night. I am leaving you now. You may accompany me to the estate if you wish. You have my word. I will not harm these men. At least tonight. She adds as she walks out of the door. Trent breaks the silence. She killed those men in Lufkin, and you knew it? He pulls his gun and stands up like he's about to go after her. I tell him to sit down. Yes, she killed those men in Lufkin, and if you go out after her, she will kill you just as easily. He looks at me hard. You talk like she's a Rougarou herself. Trust me, she makes the Rougarou look like a puppy. I am leaving to go after her and see my father. I'll need to go back and get a good night's sleep. I wouldn't follow us. Her promise means nothing. And when she's on the prowl, she's one of the scariest things in the woods. Wow, fantastic stuff there, Jim. Wonderful, wonderful gripping story. I love how it's all coming together now. As ever, guys, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments. Please do like and share and help build the channel and smash the community through to the 10k mark before April. You can only do that with your help and support. I hope you're all well and happy and enjoying your start to the week. And above all, remember, if you're going out to the deep, dark forest, or maybe a haunted, abandoned chateau, estate in south of France. Keep your wits about you, eyes and ears open. And above all, remember, be safe, not sorry.